Hi everyone, how are you? I am here with my viral wisdom number 61. How is everyone? Let me get set up here. Welcome everyone, tell me where you're signing in from. I'm here with my Viral Wisdom 61. It's been 61 sessions, pretty incredible. And I am excited and humbled each time you join me, so I don't take it lightly. Check in and tell me how you're doing, where in the world you're signing in from. I'd love to hear. Hi guys, hi Nas from Vancouver. I see you both on Facebook and Instagram. So I'm gonna give people a few minutes to join in. Hi, Simi Feza from South Africa. Simi from California, Gina, Ottawa. Hi guys. Happy birthday, Janelle. Pyle from India. I'm just gonna give people a few minutes to join in. Chetna from San Francisco. Hi guys. So today I'd really like to focus on getting very clear about where our power lies in life. You know, this pandemic has given us this feeling of helplessness, of being out of control, of being away, stripped off, disconnected from our power. We feel like we don't have much control over anything. And while this has always been true, there has also been another undeniable fact that has been true. And that undeniable fact is what I wanna really highlight today. The undeniable fact is our power resides in our mind. And I know you've heard about this, our beliefs shape our perceptions, our beliefs shapes our story, but it is true. And I'm here to really highlight this because we've never, had any power on the outside, except for the way we interpret, the way we react, the way we have a worldview around what is happening on the outside. So it's cliche, it's the core of all self-help movements. <laughs> That's why it's called self-help, because you realize that the only way you can help yourself is by owning the power you have within. But today we're gonna to go deeper into this and I'm going to really help you pull it out of yourself because it's one thing to know things intellectually, but it's a whole other kettle of fish to implement it moment by moment by moment. So when we say our power lies within us, duh, people know that. What does it really mean? It means that our emotional world, the way we feel impacts the way we feel. So where does the way we feel get formed? Where does the way we feel get shaped? Well, it gets primarily foundationally shaped in childhood and via our culture, the cultural injunctions that we inherit. But this way we feel, we feel is rigid, is ossified, is petrified into stone because it's just the way we feel. So if somebody says something mean to us, we're like, I'm feeling really bad. If we feel um, like we're going to lose our jobs, we're like, that equals feeling really bad. If somebody dumps us or betrays us or leaves us in a relationship, we're conditioned to feel really bad. So these equations that we create in our mental framework, this on the outside equals this on the inside over and over and over again shapes how we primarily feel in our lives. What we don't realize is that these equations are not petrified, not fossilized. They are ever up for interpretation, ever up for reformation, ever up for recasting. We can recast the entire script in our mind when we decide that we hold the power, when we realize that these equations, these mental frameworks and mental equations are primarily habits, conditionings, 
patterns. They are not out of our free will. And once we realize this, that what? Wait a second. Somebody just called me stupid, fat, and ugly, and now hmm, it's up to me how I feel about this? No. Culture has told me that I am supposed, I should, I have every right to feel outraged, indignant, reactive, upset. If I'm about to lose my job, culture has said, I have every right to be in a panic. I have every right to enter scarcity because I remember my parents told me growing up, life is suffering, life is hard. There are only limit, limited number of jobs. There's only so much money in the world. What, does money grow on trees? If my partner chooses to be with someone else, hmm, culture, the taboos around sexuality and the mores around marriage have told me that this breaking of the vow that this poor partner took 20 years ago is now a sacrilege, a blasphemy. Culture has told me that I should be down in the dumps because huh, my partner now loves someone else. So now when you come to the realization or the possibility that, wait a second, there's another way to feel about it. I have an option. I have a, a choice. It, it messes with your brain because culture has sent you down one railroad track to one horizon. You see, culture is very clever. It loves mass control. So it's like, let, let's not be very creative. Let's not have options. Let's not have choices because then there, there'll be anarchy. There'll be people running amok. Hello, people will think that they can just be, what, happy all the time? How will I sell my Botox? How will I sell my cars? How will I make money of happiness? Happiness doesn't sell. You know, every time a wisdom teacher or a motivational speaker does a workshop, the first thing they have to ask themselves, I train my coaches, is figure out what is the pain point. If you're not pressing on the pain point of people and showing them that they're suffering and therefore you have the answer to the suffering, they're not going to buy your course. There, I just gave you my secrets. So this is, this is human nature. We need to suffer because this is conditioned into our psyche, both from childhood, but also a highly capitalist economical culture, right? Economics of our culture is predicated on our suffering. So, and, and mass control, mass control predicated on fear and submission and repression and lack and, and need and craving so that we can keep thinking, oh, if I buy those pairs of shoes, I'll feel happier. Oh, if I get into, get really unhappy, I'll need medication or alcohol or something. And so I'll buy, 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 buy. So culture doesn't like us to have options. So when you come into the realization that you are now in charge of how you react, how you think, how you respond, anti-culture, at first it's, it's highly disorienting. And then you're pissed off because you're like, why didn't anyone tell me for the last 50 years I've been bloody upset every day of my life and controlled and tethered by the external world. And now I realize that I didn't have to be. I didn't have to follow the cultural equations of when this happens, feel like this. When this happened, feels like this. I didn't know I had a choice, right? So we have been living asleep, sheep to the slaughterhouse, thinking there's only one way to react to every external situation, right? If somebody pisses us off, we have to fight back. If somebody fights with us, we have to fight back. If our child is throwing a tantrum, we have to throw a tantrum. If they're upset, we have to be upset, right? This codependent nature of our raising, of our conditioning is genius because it keeps us submissive, keeps us subversive, keeps us under the radar, keeps us highly childlike in this state of constant enmeshment with the outside world. If this happens, then I am tethered to it, so I must immediately react. And this reactive pattern, this enmeshed codependent equation that we make external to internal is what keeps economy ticking, is what keeps us depressed, is, is what keeps us in a highly anxious state. And so the carousel turns, right? And the conveyor belt of life keeps moving robotically, zombified into cycles of, of happiness and sadness, happiness and sadness, right? How do we jump off this bandwagon? to something that is more elevated, something that is more permanent, something that is eternal. You see, happiness is not eternal, neither is sadness. But when we keep it as a cycle, we feel like, oh, 
I can catch it again. And then we're unhappy. And then we can catch it again. And the cycle is eternal. But happiness and sadness is never eternal. There's something eternal that we can touch. But that is only when we jump off this reactive equation, habitual pattern, conveyor belt of life. And the only way to do that is when we understand that we hold complete authority, complete authority over our inner terrain. Our feelings are called our feelings because they are ours. They're not bound by culture. They're not dictated by the external world. So call me fat, stupid, and ugly. Now I get a choice. Hmm. Hmm. I really want to react the way I've been conditioned. But when I react the way I've been conditioned, I give this external thing my power. I act as if it's real. And the minute I act as if it's real, now I have handed over my authority to this external being. Any stranger on the road can have this power, and they do. Our colleagues have this power, our bosses have this power, the economy, the president, right? All sorts of things on the outside abduct us and take our power away. But when we decide that every single feeling is ours, like our little children, and we cannot squander them and we cannot give them to the wolves, we will change the internal paradigm. We will realize, mm, I have a choice in every single moment, even though culture has puppeteered me to think that I am just a robot, a sheep in their vast matrix. So this takes enormous inner control, inner authority, inner sovereignty. It's a declaration to the external world that you do not own me anymore. Not you, not you, not you, not it. Right now, this is terrifying for the people in our lives because they see us hold our shoulders strong and high and our chin defiant and rebellious and our eyes clever, discerning, not gullible and naive. The little girl and the little boy in us wakes up. This is terrifying for the people around us and they are going to react and they're going to call us bitches and bastards and bloody this and bloody that, whatever. This is how we curse in India. And we are going to then be petrified because here we are zealous and ingested with enthusiasm and we are awakening. But now as we awaken, everybody on the outside begins to bully us back into submission because they are in the old paradigm, you see? And they're like, wait a second. If we're going to be robots, you will be a robot with me. If we're going to be ruled by fear and lack and depression and anxiety every day of our life and look at this as woe is me, so will you. If I'm a victim, you will be one with me, right? And so everyone on the outside rebels. And this petrifies us and we want to run back into, scurry back into our little labyrinth of madness, of delusion, of of collective anxiety, because it's so nice to be part of the masses. Part of awakening is destroying our connection to the masses. And sometimes the masses is our mass, the mass idiocy and unconsciousness of our, of our immediate families, right? And we're saying no more, no more. I will love you. I will adore you. I will take care of you even, but I will not be controlled by you. And this relinquishment of our control from the outside world and the reclamation of it back into our own lives is a huge phenomenon in our lives, in the awakening process. And it's scary, it's disorienting, but it is where ultimate liberation lies. It's really simple. It's you decide how you feel. You decide how you react. It takes tremendous mental prowess to override the cultural dogma that we have indoctrinated ourselves with. You see, that's where you can't just be smart because you just be book smart. And actually book smart people are the most followers of the, of the paradigm, of the traditional paradigm. This takes something more than just being smart. It takes a power of a wise mind. 
a discerning mind, a daring mind to burst the bubbles that have been surrounding us. We've been living in bubbles, bubbles of lies, bubbles of fear, bubbles of bullshit, which have actually kept us divorced from who it is we really are. So entering your power means moment by moment, seeing how you are robotically reacting to the external world. It takes tremendous inner control. It takes awareness, meaning you have to be awake. You know, to be aware is not to be sentient, breathing, seeing, hearing, listening, touching. It means to transcend the cyclical robotic conveyor belt of reactions that we have been engaging in till now. It's rising above that. And that can only happen with a very powerful mind. And this powerful mind is what culture is terrified of, especially a woman who touches her powerful mind because she is an uncontrollable woman. She is an untethered woman. She is a woman who is unchecked and unmitigated. She is beyond fear, beyond puppeteering, beyond being controlled. And this is for the man who awakens too, right? This is a human who has now realized that mass control is not their cup of tea. Mass belonging is not something that they seek. They want something else for their lives. They value that they are here for a moment in time and that they want to live this incarnation with as much freedom as possible. This means moving away from the masses because masses are controlled by fear. So the minute you want to move into something beyond happiness, sadness, and fear, and touch eternal joy, you will move away from the masses. To move away from the masses, right, means to unsubscribe. You know, you have to unsubscribe to the robotic reactivity of mass culture. And take back your full autonomous liberation. You are a liberated being. You are free. The only reason you don't feel free is because you have given authority. You have given sovereignty. You have given it up. Now, if you give it up, what to do? Right? Now, culture does that. Culture wants us to give it up because culture thrives on order, you know, predictability, brainwashing. So all of us think alike, okay? You know, so that we all feel like we're one part of a big happy family. You be the mommy, you be the daddy, and we are all the children. But this is not the way of true adulthood. True adulthood means true diversity. True adulthood means understanding our shared humanity, but our absolute, different, specific, unique manifestations. Just because you feel like that doesn't mean I feel like that, even if we're married. Even if we're mother and daughter, you are on your own life path. This is scary because we want to be part of the, of the womb. We don't want to grow up, right? We, we don't want to be out there because we don't believe that we can do this on our own. We don't believe that we have this knowing within us that is full, complete, and, and whole, right? We are so severed from wholeness that we want mommy and daddy and our siblings around us. So we join congregations, we join groups, we join cults. But the truth is that you don't need any of this. It's been a lie that you need it. It's such a total garbage. It's a great way though to keep us young and popping pills and ch channel surfing because it keeps us zombified. But true power, is that you are alone and you are full alone. You are whole alone. You're alone anyway. It's just the illusion that you belong, you know, in tradition, in loyalty to the past, in family, ancestry, heritage. This is, this is all bullshit because it's, it's keeping us all together in the illusion of oneness. But it is not. It is enmeshment and dependency. True oneness can only come when you are one, First, with yourself. Oneness doesn't come from enmeshment. Oneness comes when you have walked your path alone and you are completely 100% whole on that path. 
When you are fully on that path of self-actualization, self-awakening, self-realization, then you can be one with another because oneness with another implies not abducting them of their power, not robbing them of their sovereignty. Oneness is you stay one with the isness of the other one's one, right? It's not slivered parts to make a whole. That is codependency. So when you are ready to take the daring step forward, to realize that you are fully capable of knowing who you are, you don't need culture to define you. You don't need a weighing scale to define you. You don't need your clothes to define you. You get to choose moment by moment how you want to manifest this iteration called your being, yourself, your name. Whatever your name is in this lifetime, you can change it 10 times, by the way. But whatever it is in this lifetime, this iteration of you has full authority over your inner world. You don't have to be sad because culture said you need to. So in this time of the pandemic, culture now is going through mass grief, mass anxiety. It's normal, it's natural to a point. After a point, you are just giving out your power. You're just giving it away. So you get to decide what is the point where it's healthy to feel some anxiety, to feel some grief, of course. But to understand why we're feeling this grief, Right? We're feeling it because we have been confronted with a natural cycle of death. We have been confronted with the natural cycles of change. We have been confronted with the naturalness of an unknown future. This pandemic is particularly scary because we have become, we have been forced to enter the raw, unadulterated state of reality. No adornments. Times Square, shut down. Broadway, shut down. I live in New York. Done, done, done. Cancelled. Right? So now we are, the rubber is meeting the road in such a palpable way that it's terrifying for those who have been dependent on padded seats and fancy cars and glistening silver and chrome. Touching the road with our bare feet is, is, is terrorizing. But that's all that's happening. We're touching the raw reality of life that there's death, that there's constant unknown, that everything is uncertain, life is a crapshoot, there is no mother or father on the outside, and now we need to choose, how are we going to vaccinate ourselves? Are we gonna vaccinate ourselves and inseminate ourselves with the virus of fear? Or are we going to decide a new path? Are we going to choose a new way? Controlling our feelings, deciding how we want to feel, is where your power lies. It doesn't lie in the next election. A little bit, but not much. It doesn't lie in whether COVID comes, goes, or the next COVID comes, because life will constantly cycle with one external challenge after the other. Life's challenges don't go away. You know, you're seeing that. You're like, now what? Right? As if as if life before was beautiful and safe. No, we're just seeing things on a global level now. And we're like, now what? Another person died? Now what? Something else? It's not, it's always been like this. It's now on social media. And now we're sitting at home in our pajamas and we're paying attention. Black lives matter, always mattered. This is not new. We're just seeing it now. And because we're not on vacation and not distracted, we're watching the videos more carefully. Now we're following the trail of breadcrumbs, but they were always there. Nothing is new, but now we're just seeing it barefoot, you see? Now the coals are touching us because we don't have the padding of our seductions and our addictions anymore. We're, we have the opportunity to wake up. So now it is your individual choice. Please do not count on your partner to enlighten you. Do not count on your children to help you out. Your children may never be going to college now. Your children may be at home. They are in their own spiral. Do not count on your government to come and rescue you. They are, they are, they are persona non grata as far as wisdom is concerned. The only place now to turn is yourself. To ask yourself, do I have the capacity to elevate 
into my greatest next iteration. This is about my awakening. This is about my inner connection. Mm, this is a test, isn't it? Even if you believe in the Palladians and the 12th dimension and the conspiracy theory, it doesn't matter. It still comes down to what is your test? What is your challenge? What does this mean for you? Who cares why it's happening? An intergalactic war on the moon and the aliens from planet Zombifu are, are here to plant us with messages. You know, whatever you believe, it doesn't matter. Because ultimately, it's how you feel. How are you feeling today? How are you in your body today? How are you able to look at the sun and greet the day and feel the wind? How is that working out for you? Republican or Democratic? Palladians or not? Aliens or not? Bill Gates hater or not? How does it matter? All that is noise. You get wrapped up in noise because you want something to hold on to. You want something to be angry about. Instead of anger, turn it into activism, right? Make a change. Stand up for what you believe in, but don't cry about it. Don't bemoan it. Don't guilt someone because of it. Don't shame others because of it, because all that is wasted energy. That's your, um, that's your desire to displace your anxiety. Either you take action or you take action. That's it. There's no other choice. And the greatest action first you need to take is in your own body, in your own heart, in your own mind. How are you feeling today? And if you're messed up, don't look at the outside world. Don't even try to make change in the outside world. First, take care of how you are feeling. Simplify, declutter, streamline, get rid of excess, stop the wastage, stop the addictions, clean your body, clean your mind, take self-help courses, learn, evolve, grow. There is so much you need to do that you have neglected in, in the thirst for your child going to a fancy college and your child getting a trophy and your child and your child and your child. Now start focusing on yourself and elevate to a new level of feeling, a feeling that is not tethered on the outside world, a feeling that can stay grounded in an eternal sense of transcendence despite what is happening in the outside world. Now work on that. And until you work on that, don't come out of quarantine, right? Stay in quarantine till you work on your eternal sense of joy, right? It's a good thing we are in timeout because we were all discombobulated, disconnected, disenfranchised, messed up. We needed to be in quarantine a long time ago because we were contagious. Our toxicity was contagious. We were all working out of ego. We were all working out of competition. We were going down the wrong path. So we needed to stop. Look at it that way. Again, you have the choice how you want to look at it. You can think that, you know, the government is here to implant chips in you and to mastermind you. And fine, you can think that too. But what good, is, what good does that do? It's a waste of time. Where you can spend your energy is on your eternal joy, on reaching your elevated plane of existence. Now work on that. And until that happens, don't come out, right? Work on your inauthenticities. Take out your lying, duplicitous masks. Show up for yourself. Be open with yourself. Be healing of yourself. Now that is going to take me a few years. I don't know about you. Not that I want COVID to stay around. I just want to stay focused on what I need to do. And this has woken me up and jolted me to realize that I was on the wrong path. I was in excess. I was in ego. And now I need to go back home, sit quietly, stop buying things, and really focus on inner connection and inner growth. So this is all about how you feel, not about how someone else made you feel, not about what's happening on the outside world, not about how your children feel, how you feel. So having said that, I am holding my first live online summit ever on September 18th. It is going to be seven plus hours like this, nonstop, all through the day, Eastern time. I invite you to join. When you do, you will get a bonus masterclass sent to your inbox. You will get three of my latest books sent to your home, even if you already have it. You'll get three more with the price of registration sent to your home. And you will get seven hours of me in my online summit and five amazing guests. So registration, somebody should post the registration on Instagram and Facebook. Look for it. 
um, or join my newsletter and I'll send the registration in a mailing to you. And I hope I see you there. This is the time to catapult your growth. In order to catapult your growth, you have to take action. You have to do something. You have to learn how to think differently. When you take charge of your mind and learn the art of, of interpreting your reality that's in alignment with higher growth, you will come out of this a winner. This is a wonderful portal. Painful, but nothing comes without a bit of pain because the pain is really not really pain. It's the pain of shedding the old ways. But when you learn to shed the old ways, you create space for the new. So I hope I see you September 18th for my first live online summit called Revolve. It's a play on Evolve because Evolve is my regular in-person summit that I hold every year and I can't do it this year. So I've called this Revolve because it's more than just evolution. We need a revolution. We need to reform, recast, reimagine, and rebirth. So I hope I see you September 18. Join me. Otherwise, you'll have FOMO. I know it. Okay, guys. Thank you for joining me. Viral Wisdom 61, down and out. Take care, everyone. Register for Revolve.